there was a book that came out by a woman named Sally Norton called Toxic Superfoods. And she made the following points. She said that she herself had health issues arising from a diet low in animal fats and high in vegetables. Um, and she said there's a significant yet often overlooked problem of oxalate toxicity, which can subtly deteriorate health over time. She identifies common foods like potatoes, peanuts, and chocolate as major sources of dietary oxalates. Norton explains the concept of bioaccumulation, where oxalates build up in body tissues over time, leading to health issues when high oxalate foods are discontinued. Norton oxalates disrupt cellular function by interfering with essential minerals like calcium and magnesium, impacting cellular communication and overall health. The well-known link between oxalates and kidney stones is emphasized. Norton emphasized the importance of a balanced diet while being cautious of oxalate content. Based on the principles of reducing oxalate intake, the following foods are generally considered safer options. Um, low oxalate vegetables such as lettuce, cucumbers, and mushrooms, meats, and poultry, beef, chicken, and other meats are naturally free of oxalates, dairy products, milk, cheese, and other dairy products which provide calcium that can help bind oxalates in the gut, eggs, a versatile protein source without oxalate, fruits, certain fruits like apples, bananas, and melons tend to have lower oxalate levels. Norton's approach is not about completely avoiding all oxalates, but rather being mindful of high oxalate foods and their potential impact on health. The following foods are that are high in oxalates, high oxalate vegetables, spinach, Swiss chard, and beet greens, nuts and seeds, especially almonds, peanuts, and chia seeds, which are known to be high in oxalates, tubers, sweet potatoes, and potatoes, which can have significant oxalate content, legumes, including soy products and beans, which are often high in oxalates, grains, particularly wheat bran, and other whole grains that might contain higher oxalate levels, fruits, certain fruits like blackberries, blueberries, and kiwis, known for their higher oxalate content, Chocolate, dark chocolate, and cocoa are particularly in high in oxalates. Should we stop eating high oxalate foods? Are we at risk of getting kidney stones from too many high oxalate foods? Should we soak our beans in whole grains to help with us? Please guide us on this, both of you. Okay, so let, let's take kidney stones since um, this is really interesting. Did you know what the first treatment for calcium oxalate stones is? And all the audience that's listening in today, you know, put it in the chat. I'd, I'd love to know what you think the treatment for calcium oxalate stones is. It turns out that the treatment is simply drinking more water. How much water? We ask our patients to make two liters of urine a day. And it's very simple. is because when you think about what, how stones form, stones is debris that sticks together, and that's how it collects and it forms a stone. In a stream, you know, if you're ever in the forest, drink from a stream, well, in a pond, meaning you're in sitting around, debris can collect. And that's number one. Number two is, is it's not the oxalate that's the issue. It's the lack of calcium in the foods that you're eating. Because the calcium in the foods will actually bind to the oxalate inside your gut and you poop it out. The oxalate never enters your body. As far as oxalate poisoning is concerned and it's going in the tissues, you know, when we talk about quote-unquote poisonings and tissue deposition, we have so many animal studies where they've actually looked at tissue samples to look at what's in there. So animal studies are abundant and humans too. Now, I've been doing nephrology for over two decades and I can tell you with oxalates, yes, we talk about reducing the oxalates, but we don't tell you to throw the baby out with the bathwater. In other words, the reason this matters is because the foods that you're mentioning, if you talk about things like what is the longest living people on the planet eating, let's take that as a study and look at all of the studies that have been done looking at them. Their diet is predominantly a whole food, not a plant-based diet, quote unquote. It's a whole food plant-based diet, right? They're already doing that part. Number two is, is this is where fear mongering can go on to a whole other level. And the problem is any one of us can become an expert and start to say, well, I think you should do X, Y, and Z. This goes back to the same point that it's not one study. I saw a comment in the chat from Julie Hemmings who said the data can be interpreted in different ways. Julie, and I would answer that question by saying, this is why we don't rely on one study. This is why we look at what are the conflicts of interest? 
Where was the study published? How large is the population? Where else was it replicated? Was it completely different people? How many times has it been replicated? And those are all that are going to strengthen the evidence. So I would caution on a lot of these comments because of the fact that what we want to see is we want to see the data. We know that we have the ability to do tissue biopsies and we can get the data on quote-unquote oxalate deposition in the organs. We can reduce oxalates in the diet, but more importantly, a diet that's rich in whole foods, the calcium will actually bind to the oxalates in the gut, which will prevent the absorption in the first place. And so there's all this stuff that's important in physiology to understand, and that's why it's easier for me to say stuff that sounds exciting and people will you know, be attracted to that and you get more followers, it's a lot more boring to say stuff that, no, we may not have the data. It's not as exciting. And I get that. You know, having lived with thousands of patients over the years and fed them and controlled their environment, I can tell you that although there are definitely people that have food sensitivities, sometimes it could be oxalate, sometimes it could be lectin. There are people that have all kinds of allergies and sensitivities overall the the issue is the diet is an integrity as a whole and people that adopt whole plant food diets and start doing basic things like hydrating adequately most of this stuff goes away it's a very rare exception that you're having to get into very specific uh, dietary manipulations where you have to uh, identify whole classes of whole foods in terms of dietary regulation it's just a it's an exception not the rule thank you um According to Michael Greger's research, consumption of nuts is associated with reduced risk of premature death, making them an essential component of a diet aimed at promoting longevity. Dr. Greger highlights walnuts in particular for their omega-3 content and potential in improving artery function. Do you agree? And what are the health effects of a diet high in plant fats like raw seeds, raw nuts, avocados, and olives? What are the pros and cons? There are some people that are um, suggesting uh, a lot of this and others that are suggesting that we try to avoid fats because um, it, 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 they're saying it's a cause of a uh, high blood sugar. So what is your thoughts on? Well, you know, you fat? can certainly overdo anything and overdoing uh, nuts and seeds is easy to do because they're very concentrated foods. So it is one of the foods that we regulate quantity. We suggest people limit their, in general, consumption of nuts and seeds to an ounce a day, because we're looking for around 15 to 18% of calories coming from fat uh, for most people and around 10% of calories from protein. And so, although we might regulate how much of that we, we recommend, we certainly include nuts and seeds for the vast majority of people. They are excellent sources of concentrated nutrition. It's just a little bit easier to overdo them. One thing that's great suggestion I find is to make people use nuts and seeds in the shell you know, by the time you shell six walnuts and eat them, you want to move on with your life because it takes a lot more time than it does to be eating nut butters and other things like that. So sometimes it's just a question of quantity. Uh, and, you know, again, are there people that have nut sensitivity? Sure. There are people that, you know, if they eat one, they, they can't stop and they have eating related issues. And so they may have to modify their diets to accommodate their particularities. But for most people, nuts and seeds can be a very beneficial part of the diet. However, the um, reductionist claims that it's the nuts and seeds that are making people live longer is a mistake. I suggest people read T. Colin Campbell's book, Whole. It's the diet as a whole that seems to be the most important variable, not the specific isolated uh, products within it. And this uh, incessant attempt to look for superfoods, instead of understanding it's the diet as a whole that is where, where the power lies, not the, necessarily the individual components isolated or or contracted, I think that's better advice. Thank you. And then from a kidney perspective, the only thing that we're worried about in terms of fats is just the saturated fats. That's where we have the correlation where higher intakes of saturated fat is linked to higher protein in the urine. So if you already have protein in the urine, you're more likely to have more of it if you start to increase it. And then in terms of nuts, in terms of one being better than the other, that I don't have any data to be able to say that there's such thing as a super nut, which is kind of funny in itself. But all we end up saying is, is that if you're going to have nuts, they are overall healthy. Just be careful of the ones that you get packaged. You know, it's it's a funny thing what Dr. Goldhammer said in terms of having to, <laughs> to peel it yourself. I'm going to use that with my patients. I, I think that's brilliant. 
Because the analogy I give them is like, don't keep bad food in the home because if it's in the home, it's in your mouth. Also, they're so, fresher, uh, you know, and there, there's a lot of advantages to using whole nuts, uh, you know, but the I, biggest one is you just can't overeat as easily. And, and you know, that my, my worry on the package ones is, is oftentimes like they got all this stuff added. They got a ton of salt added. And I, I tell you, there's this thing, people crave salt, sugar, and fat. You know, we were biologically designed that way to crave it from a, a just a survival perspective. Right. And we figured out how to manipulate the heck out of it. But this is why French fries are so evil. I hate to say it, but you know, more, I mean, I have more patients who struggle with French fries than anything else. Because if you think about it, it's fat. It's, you know, salt and it's sugar and it's the perfect mix all there. And that's why this whole concept of, you know, trying to get rid of these things are really, really hard. If you give them all three at once, all the dopamine in your head lights up. We, we wrote a whole book about it. It's called The Pleasure Trap, The Hidden Force That Undermines Health and Happiness. And I just tell patients, instead of eating those French fries, just find the deep fryer, stick your head in and suck because that's what you're doing. <laughs> 